Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the NAS Skills Master Class webinar series. Um, I'm just going to let the oh, let the screen refresh here because um, the sponsor is uh, Liberty Grove Software. Uh, who have been kind enough to pay for an extension of the number of people who can attend this webinar. So um, today we are going to talk about uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, as you may know, there has been a new uh, update, the June updates available. So you go to your um, Azure account and refresh your uh, development preview VM, and you will see the uh, the new uh, bits and pieces. Uh, unfortunately, uh, fortunately, it's before the webinar, but unfortunately, I have not had a lot of time to really look at it. Uh, so the only thing that we can show you really today is what was prepared by the presenters. So um, let me just quickly introduce the presenters. We have Eric Wouters, who are also known as Waldo from Belgium. We have Eric Hogard from uh, Vancouver. Arend John Kaufman is joining us from Poznan in Poland. My name is Daniel Rimmelswan. I am in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, we are uh, chock full of demos today, so uh, let's just go right into the demo. Uh, we'll start with uh, Eric Wouters. Switch him to so. presenter. Oh, you already are a presenter. Go ahead, Eric. I am a presenter, and am I showing something? I am not, not yet. yet. No. Now you see something, right? No. Oh, well, you should. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. So what you should see at the moment is a, a Visual Studio Code <laughs> editor. Is that correct? Yes. I can see it, yes. Okay. So um, <clears throat> what I will talk about a little bit today is uh, about uh, the dependencies of extensions. Last time we have been creating an extension. This time, um, just a few words on dependent extension because this might be interesting as well. And uh, last but not least, uh, I only have two topics today. I will talk a little bit on PowerShell and VS Code as well. Actually making PowerShell part of your workspace in, uh, in VS Code. People still think that, that is not possible or useful. We might reconsider after, <laughs> after the day, let's hope. So, um, for the dependent extensions, um, well, why would we have uh, dependent extensions? Well, it helps uh, create structure. Not having to put everything in one big extension, but even make uh, structure or create structure in, um, yeah, let's say logical reusability of uh, extensions. And obviously, uh, the smaller you get, uh, make an extension, the more you increase the flexibility of an extension. Um, now, what is a dependency? Basically, when in extension version one, we had uh, prerequisites and we had dependencies. And I noticed, noticed that a lot of times these were like, um, 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 how do you say that in English? <laughs> um, mistaken for each other. So uh, now, in version two in extensions, we don't have prerequisites anymore. But prerequisites were uh, actually indications that these objects needed to be in the database before you would be able to publish or install an extension. Dependencies is completely not like that. Dependencies is dependencies, uh, dependencies between extensions. So one extension might be dependent on another. And uh, what we have been uh, using this for is um, maybe for making an extension, um, uh, how do you say it, localized in a country. Uh, when you have a worldwide extension, which, which should work worldwide, might just not be legal in Belgium. Basically, that happens a lot, <laughs> that worldwide functionality is not legal in Belgium. So we might want to change some bits and pieces, and that's when we are able to create an extension on top of another extension, changing the business logic a little bit and making that extension still being an extension, being able to publish it and, and install it as an extension and being legal as, as can be. 
So how do we do that? Well, it is just a matter of definition. Uh, in the app.json, we are going to identify that this or a certain extension is going to be a dependent extension by uh, declaring a dependency. And this is done by declaring the GUID of the dependent extension, uh, a name, a publisher, and a version. And here is an example of what you might want to add in uh, the app.json. On top of that, we are going to add the Navix file in the packages folder. This Navix file of the original extension, the base extension, is going to act like a symbol file for our dependent extension. We might want to go into that later on when we demo that. Um, now, what happens? So because we, at a certain point, we are going to in, have to install two extensions. One. Uh, in this scenario, for instance, we have two extensions, extension B, which is depending on extension A. So extension B has a dependency on A. So a lot of checking and uh, uh, stuff is going on while you publish and while you, while you install these extensions. So while, while you publish uh, extension A, yeah, nothing special is going on because A is the base extension, it's not depending on anything while B depends on A, so when you publish B, A just must be installed. If A is not installed, there will be an error. Or, sorry, published. Uh, when you're installing, so both are already... Um, uh, like when you're installing, obviously when you install A, A must be published already. When you install B, A must be published, and if A is not installed yet, it will be installed automatically. It's just going to check the database whether um, what is the current status of both extensions. And for uninstalling and unpublishing, we have similar scenarios. So there is a dependency, there is a hard-coded dependency, and publishing and installing is going to take this into account. So let's see how that might work. So I'm going to open my base app and my dependent app. And at this point, I shouldn't have installed or published any of those. Now, the functionality of this app doesn't really matter. Um, just let me open the app JSON so you can see the definition. Uh, left is the main app, which is just an item classification app with a certain ID. Um, and a certain publisher and a certain version. There are no dependencies whatsoever, and as you can see, in the application, we declare the dependencies. On the right side, we see um, the app and uh, the dependent app. So this is going to be a different name, obviously, item classification dependent. Okay, the name doesn't really uh, isn't really useful, but uh, it's it's a certain publisher, it doesn't really matter uh, if it's the same one or not, and a certain version. But what does matter is this uh, attribute right here, the dependencies. So what I did, I declared one dependencies with a certain app. By declaring the app ID, the same one as my main app, uh, the item classification name, basically, the publisher and the version. So this is clearly going to be depending on this one. That's step one. Step two is declare or, or the making sure the symbol files are okay. So you know that symbol files are by default being put into the packages folder to be able to code against a certain app database. And by default, when you download the symbol, we get the system tables and system uh, objects, and we get the application objects. Uh, on top of that, now we need the dependent extension. So we can simply do that by copying the Navix file that this base app generates to the packages folder, um, and basically which is the symbols for my dependent app. And in that case, I will be able to code against the objects that I have in my base app. So when I publish the first one, It's going to open page 22, uh, basically because in my launcher JSON, page 22 is set as an 
a launch uh, or actually a, a page ID to, st to start. So um, again, the functionality does not really matter. I added some kind of wizard. Uh, this wizard adds some data. I just wanted to add that data to show you the functionality. In the items uh, list, I have here a button. And if I press that button, something happens. A calculation happens. Again, not really important. The thing is, what I want to do is I want to code against this main application. So basically what I would like to do is change the behavior of this method. If I click here, I don't want the calculation to happen. I want something else to happen, basically show a message. And that's basically what I did here. So by, oh, sorry, uh, by creating a code unit, which subscribes to that method of this main app. So this is the part where I code against objects that are part of another extension. And do know I am not able to, to see the code. Yes, I can see the code because there, there is the code, but if I just would have uh, had this Navix file, I, I, I would have been able to do the same. Yeah? Um, so let's just forget this for a minute. Um, I am able to subscribe to a code unit, code unit 70,050,000. And as you can see, that is, oh, sorry. I'm going to open this one. That is this code unit, 70, 50,000. And what I would like to do is subscribe on this method. And my IntelliSense is aware of the context because my Navix file is acting as a symbol file. So I am able to code against this one and subscribe to the right event. I will be setting a, uh, a handled uh, Boolean, which is the handle Boolean of my event, this one. Uh, so there is some interaction between them. So let me test this. This message should appear instead of the calculation that should happen. Execute this. It does succeed. In my launch.json, just that you understand, I don't have any page that should be um, executed, so there is nothing popping at that moment, but I can reuse this. And now if I want to calculate another item and I press the button, you see that the method was decoupled by installing a new extension which extended another extension, basically by being a dependent extension. Lots of extensions going on here. So that was actually my uh, very basic story on how dependencies can be made. It's very simple. Uh, you don't need the code anymore. And um, that's it. Next topic uh, Eric, that I... Sorry. Uh, yes. can, can, I, can I add a comment quickly? This is uh, the other Eric. Um, in reality, now we have the NavX files, which both hold our uh, extension, but also our symbols. Um, mm -hmm. So in many ways, these files start to behave just like DLL files. Uh, and DLL files are also dependent. So um, it's just another step closer to something that actually looks like the rest of the world, even though this concept might be be foreign and new to uh, to the NAV world, the concept of including DLL files and DLL files are depending on other DLL files is a very common and very practical way that, that basically the, the whole Windows ecosystem works with. Yeah, definitely. So it's something we need to get used to as being NAV developers, but very common in a normal development world, let's say. <laughs> Another thing that's very normal in development world is PowerShell. <laughs> so um, what I get the question uh, sometimes is like, is PowerShell still going to be useful? Well, let's let's try to look into that. Um, now, um, in extensions version one, how we have been doing it for the last two years, uh, we needed a how do you say that in decent English? I don't know uh, a very much a lot load of <laughs> PowerShell. Um, the thing is that 
seems to disappear because all you have seen me doing is just press F5. By pressing F5, uh, this Navix file was being created, being basically being compiled to, to an extension file. By pressing S5, even my, um, my uh, client popped up and basically showed the extension in my app, which means it published and installed uh, my extension to whatever was set up in the launch.json. So to my local server, to Navision main, to the default tenant. No PowerShell, not at all. So does this make PowerShell completely useless? Well, I'm not giving up. It does not being completely useless because it gets your extension in, but it doesn't get your extension out. So basically, your uh, um, to get your extension out, the only thing what you would be able to do without PowerShell is go into the client, go to the extension management and uninstall your extension. But basically, your extension will still be there. To completely unpublish your extension, therefore, you still need PowerShell. And obviously, to have a look at what extensions you have published and installed, it's still useful to, um, to use Power, PowerShell for that. So this is an example where I have like a, a script where I delete and basically uninstall and unpublish first the dependent extension and then all the rest of the extensions, all extensions except the Microsoft extensions. Another uh, uh, example is running objects. As you have seen um, in the launch.json, I was able to run a page, but how do I run a table? How do I run a report or a code unit? That is still being possible with PowerShell. Now, running um, uh, in the web client, you can only run the uh, a page and the report, but in the Windows client, you are able to run about all objects. So here's an example, for instance, where I run the table that I just created in my extension in the Windows client um, as an object. So this should be the item classification table and the data that I have created to, uh, with the wizard. Or you can also just run a code unit. So these are things normal developers tend to do quite a lot, but it's quite difficult to do that when you're just using Visual Studio Code. And as you can see, by a simple script, you would be able just to do that with PowerShell. And last but not least, um, uh, the new, uh, the April update of the developer preview, and now the pre this uh, update that uh, was published today um, includes a converter tool. The update today actually includes the possibility to convert also Delta objects. I have not gone into that. We will not go into that. This is about PowerShell. Uh, but the way it works is, to be honest, a little bit cumbersome. You need you need that, uh, the command shell to export from FinSQL. Now this has been finished. You now you can use PowerShell to export objects to, and this was actually the trick, uh, the trick, the one that you needed. You ex you needed to export to the new syntax. Now you are able to do this with PowerShell as well. But the last update you were not able to do that. Then the second step you want to split your object, and the third step. You need a command, um, those command to call the text to AL to basically convert your split objects to AL objects. Now, obviously, this is able. Uh, you can all combine that into a script. This is just an example where I convert all the job queue um, functionality in nav, export that, split that, and convert that to um, AL. Uh, I'm a, not sure. uh, a quick yes. comment. Mm -hmm. um, in the June update, the uh, text to AL has changed uh, the format of the parameters and how you call it. So yeah, that might have changed. Yes, it has changed. Okay. Or okay. <laughs> so I have some work to do. You mean? <laughs> oh, it's just the one liner, but if uh, it. In, instead of having anonymous uh, parameters where 
you don't, you don't, you can only specify one thing. The new format has, um, uh, you specify what the parameters are, so it looks more like a PowerShell uh, parameter set, actually. Yeah, that's that's much better. Now. Probably in the next version, uh, it will be all PowerShell. And I would like this kind of functionality, where I can have simple have one call um, that whatever do um, converts a set of objects. Like these are all the job queue objects, which I, I like quite a lot. I, I use this quite a lot. Um, okay, so that's just a few examples on using PowerShell. The last one does not work yet. You are not able to publish or install an extension that you created um, with yeah the version two with VS Code. That is a PowerShell part that doesn't work yet. But I was confirmed that it will work and there will um, it it will be worked on. Let's say. Um, the thing is, uh, how can we make this work decently? Well. You can make PowerShell part of your um, extension as well. And you might have seen it already, uh, but in my extension, my base extension, and this is what I do quite a lot, um, I actually just create the Power, a PowerShell folder as part of my extension. I will be able to just publish this extension, and PowerShell will be part of it, but won't yeah, do anything. But it is there, and I can just use it whenever I need it. So when I have published this one, and I did, I can basically just open the uh, run objects and maybe I just want to run this code unit. And on top of that, I am able to even take advantage of the app JSON and the lounge JSON and refer to that within my PowerShell scripts, which makes the scripts a little more uh, generic and copyable to other extensions and stuff like that. So it is not cumbersome. It is actually quite like and quite useful to just include PowerShell into the extension development um, that you're doing. This basically concludes what I had prepared to show you for extension version 2. All right. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Um, I have uh, one question. Oh, no. I'm not sure how you can see the actual question. Hold on. Oh. There is a question. It doesn't show here. The, the question is, will there be a warning if you uninstall app A that it will automatically uninstall app B as well, or will that just disappear? Ah, um, now nah, well, I'm 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 not sure because um, when you uninstall A, B will be uninstalled too. <laughs> so the theory says that it will be uh, happening automatically. I have so not I, tested that, so I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm not be... sure it will, because there can also be multi dependencies. Yeah. Where you got uh, uh, extension C, uh, yeah. stuff like that. So I, I'm I'm not sure that it will do a what is known in the Linux world as an auto removal uh, of packages that are no longer referenced. But um, we'll see. No. It would not be a difficult test to try that out. I will do so while um, the next one is presenting. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's one more question. Oh, here's another question here. Oh, this is annoying. This thing is not working. I'm clicking on it and I don't see it. Yeah, I see <laughs> the John, can you see the second one? Yes, I can see that. So, um, uh, I, I, I yeah, yeah, I see. The I, I, I see the question. So the next question is: Oh, come on! There are a lot of questions now. Uh, in version in version one, you will get a warning when uh, in uninstalling extension A. So okay, thank you for that comment. Um, then it says one too many, many to one dependency also possible. Can we give in JSON? Um, so an, a one too many or uh, a many to one or many to many dependencies. 
you can be dependent on many extensions, yes. Okay. So I, I was dependent on one extension, basically it's just adding uh, multiple extensions within the dependencies uh, attribute. Well, you were in, a, in reality uh, depending on two extensions because you were depending on your own plus you were depending on the base yeah. system. True. Which in, in the simple file is just a, an extension without code that represents the base system. Yes. Yes, indeed. Uh, then the next question is, uh, will there be a converter, e.g. AL2TXT? <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> other way around. Why do we want to have that? <laughs> uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm, it's not in scope. That's, that's uh, all that's I should sure. sure. um, Not sure. What? Uh, what what will be txt because al is txt is text already so what will be then to be converted between al language and text well that would be back to the uh, the old txt format to import yeah. into the finnish ql but in reality all this is to replace finnish ql so um, there might be some, some bridging scenarios where it could be interesting, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's completely out of scope. Uh, I think so. I think we are all on a one direction way here. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, 33 minutes left for two more people, so I think we should go switch to the next person. Um, Eric, do you think you can do something? I can do something. Okay. Let me give it over to you. Go ahead. Do you see anything useful here? Uh, I can see your screen, yes. Excellent. So uh, I, w I just want to cover uh, uh, a couple of things here, uh, and the first one is one of the, uh, the newly added uh, features in uh, the June update, which where Microsoft is trying to bridge the uh, the gap between the Visual Studio Code uh, extension development environment and the, uh, the the new page designer uh, in the client. So let me just do a quick demo here. I, I've got a, um, a very simple extension here. And uh, I will now press F6. Uh, Waldo press F5 on his exam just to run. F6 will um, take us to the uh, designer. Boom. And um, I will just do a major redesign of this page, so I will now have names for uh, the numbers. And um, I'm quite satisfied with my uh, with my design now, so let me save it. And it saves, and this has been working for a while now. But the new thing is that if I go back to Visual Studio code, and uh, let me find my customer card. So uh, at the present it says number, name, address, but we know that I now changed the, the order. So I press F7. What, a seven, what F7 does is that it will actually pull um, my changes from the server back into my code here. So now name is before number which was the, the visual uh, change I made and as info the latest changes from the server has been applied. So we're getting one step closer to, um, to the visual designer that we used to have available. Um, and in many cases we're actually beyond the visual designer because the visual design we had on forms could do a lot of stuff but we never really had a visual designer on pages that was useful. Uh, so we have that now. Um, I got this yesterday, so I'm still not sure about exactly how much gets pulled and not pulled. Um, 
I suddenly also when I tried it, I got a uh, an extension because I had another, and this is a uh, this is perhaps you need to be aware of this that I was testing another extension on this database. So working on uh, this one. Save all. So I was working on this extension where I had a action somewhere and then I switched to another extension and pulled changes. So I actually was able to pull changes from one extension into another. Um, I'm not sure if that's uh, on purpose. So be aware that if you play with multiple extensions and use the seven thing, uh, be aware of what you're, you're, you're getting into the system. Um, and I just wanted to mention, uh, Eric just talked about it, um, that the, the txt to al uh, command has been made more uh, parameter aware, so you can now specify uh, the parameters, and this would make all those uh, partial uh, scripts look more pretty, even more pretty. Yeah. Um, the uh, the other thing I wanted to touch on is um, the whole concept of uh, of Visual Studio because Visual Studio is, is just a tool. Visual Studio is uh, an open platform, and um, what and let me just do this the command line way just because. Um, So a and and this is where it gets confusing because the word extension uh, is also used in Visual Studio. So in Visual Studio, uh, the nav functionality, the AL compiler, all the things that the F if six X F seven presses I just did, that's part of an extension to Visual Studio Code. Um, so in reality, what I have uh, on this machine is I have a standard Visual Studio Code installation, uh, and I've got the uh, the AL extension installed. So at some point, that got me thinking that how about all the stuff that we as MVPs and as the community in large um, are are creating that could be useful. So I, I set about um, creating a, an extension. So this is an, an extension for uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, and this is at, at present a very, very simple extension. Uh, but what I, what I was thinking that perhaps we need something um, let me find another uh, extension to show this then. So um, perhaps we we need a place to store uh, all those uh, PowerShell scripts so they can be invoked directly from uh, from the UI in the Visual Studio Code, or perhaps um, code snippets that. Are not part of the snippet uh, set in uh, supplied by Microsoft. In this case, I've, I've just uh, used the letter X to address the snippets here. So let's say I wanted to create a flow field. A flow field in the new in the AL format is kind of a, a long syntax. So oh, that's not what I want to do. X flow field sum. And this is field number something, and I'll give it a name. And the table it's connected to is perhaps the vendor ledger entry um, dot. 
amount, and so on. So a collection of, uh, of snippets uh, that's useful. The other one that it just pulled out was a um, was the idea of uh, uh, of going a bit into the uh, best practice uh, category of thing. But I want a ledger entry table. Um, so why not have a code snippet that and this one is very simple because at present my snippet just has an entry number and that's it. Uh, but why not have those best practice uh, tables, pages, uh, data ports, uh, XML ports, stuff like that, a snippet uh, available to go. But the only way we can do this um, is as a community. And I volunteered to uh, to be the guy who ties everything together and, and package it up. So the source code for this snippet, uh, not for this snippet, for this Visual Studio extension, is now on GitHub. And uh, pull requests of all kinds are more than welcome. What I'm currently working at, apart from uh, a, a snippet uh, library is a uh, is a easy way to um, to incorporate scripts. Um, uh, so hopefully, uh, some sort of collaboration with Waldo will mean that we get all those PowerShell scripts accessible from um, from the uh, the command palette. Here, so we do MVP, and now it tells me that test is not found, so that's okay. But uh, all those uninstall, whatever we come up with that is needed, and it it might be that Microsoft saying, "Oh, that one, that's a very good idea." Uh, we'll include that in the in the base package, and and that's just perfect. And then. Uh, this this extension could also become sort of a incubator for, uh, for functionality. Um, that's interesting. I think that was the the two things that were on my uh, uh, presentation list. Um, I will gladly answer some questions if there are uh, something interesting. Uh, yeah, we do have a couple of questions. There is a question that says, is the end user able to use the in-page designer itself in order to rearrange add fields? Or is that a developer only kind of thing? Well, it's also an end user thing. Uh, so there, there are, the interesting part is that what the end user will create will also become an extension. But that's just yet another extension. And that extension is the end user's extension. Uh, so I have not seen yet how the dependence, dependency stuff works if you create an extension on objects that are added by another extension. Um, but certainly, uh, it's also an end user tool. Yeah. 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 I thought so too. And then there's a few questions about the IDE. Let me see if I can summarize like two or three questions in one. It has to do with uh, whether FinSeq was fully replaced and what the IDE is and whether regular development will be done at the same time as extension development or if those two will still exist uh, like apart or if it will be uh, a single environment. Well, the end goal here is that Fin, fin SQL is getting retired. Uh, of course, you cannot replace Fin SQL before you have re replaced all the bits. Um, so, when that, I will leave that for Microsoft to um, uh, to answer. But. Let me let me touch a bit on the definition of regular development, <laughs> because in reality, what we have now with FinSQL is is there, there there are two 
two concepts. Concept one is that we develop directly on the live on the live system. We can do that. We can go into a live system. We can add fields. We can change code. We can compile. We can do anything on a live system. That's scenario A. Scenario B is that we have a staging database or a development database, and we work on that with uh, with finished girl, and then we move changes from uh, from one database to another beta database and into live, and we do that either by PowerShell or uh, by Object Manager or transport files, and there's a lot of different solutions for that. Um, the future will be that there is no development directly on live because these extensions get live compiled. So as soon as you add an extension to a live system, they will be assimilated into the system and 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 uh, compile and, and are, are live there. So regular development will also be as creating a NavX file and then throwing that NavX file at a running system. Um, so everything will eventually be in here. Um, of course, there are some stories around uh, reporting that are still weak, and uh, and uh, translation and uh, different different things. So I, I don't see Finnish girl going away right now, but it's sunsetting, uh, and and in reality, it has been sunsetting for the last I don't know. Uh, eight years or something like that, because uh, the changes we have have received in it are minimal, and uh, and it's just designed to a different uh, scenario than we have now. And this is all in the uh, with with the mindset of uh, on-prem development, but in reality, SQL is. Not suitable at all to work on MX365. Um, so yeah, it's going away. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, which version that is, by the way, is uh, anybody's guess. So uh, I don't think it, it's definitely not in the next version, the, the upcoming version. But how many versions uh, it'll take uh, is anybody's guess. Um, there's an interesting question about documentation. Is there any complete documentation for all this stuff? Um, I I would think that the MSDN library will be updated with a lot of these uh, uh, functionalities. Um, Microsoft will probably put out lots of how do I videos. Uh, the MVP channel will be very active. And the cool thing about most of the new stuff, as you can see, is uh, it's all on GitHub and public forums. So uh, all this is being published in out in the public. So it's uh, a lot of this is no longer in NDA. So it, it, the cool thing is really that the community is being activated on this part, uh, which is very exciting, I think. Uh, and you see a direct interaction with Microsoft and the community. And you see that uh, some of these things, uh, also to speak to a question from someone who's saying, why not share those snippets in the MS repo? Um, Microsoft is looking at these things, and they are incorporating suggestions left and right. So uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, my, my snippets, uh, my snippets are, are on, on the GitHub uh, that's currently on screen. Uh, and I think that's where Microsoft put their uh, the well. Yeah. So what I was going to say is that uh, it it really doesn't matter whether the snippets end up in the MVP NAV help or in the AL uh, in the AL snippet uh, repo. Uh, you can pull those into your own library at will. So it doesn't really matter whether. Microsoft incorporates them in the standard product, or if you pull them from another GitHub, uh, your snippets will live on your own computer, and so you can pull from that and extend the capabilities of your own development environment. So uh, you, you get you get both worlds. So you get the stuff from Microsoft, but you also get the stuff from the um, from the community. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have 15 minutes left for Aaron John. I don't want to steal all his time. So uh, thank you, Eric Hogard. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. And let me just switch over to 
Arantian. Arantian, you are the presenter now, so if you can share your screen, go ahead. Yeah, so um, let's do that. Um, I have uh, created myself a, um, a new version based on the uh, um, June update. So I created a new uh, virtual machine um, for everybody who wants to do that and who does not want to do, of course. Uh, I just want to uh, point you to one thing. Um, if you uh, do that, you will see a couple of changes and, and copying over your code from uh, the and the April update to, to the June update uh, is not possible without doing uh, modifications. One of them is in the launch.json. Um, as you can see here in the launch.json on, on line 8 and 9, you see the, um, the curly uh, lines, the green lines, and the project root and package file name. Um, that means that those are not used anymore and recognized and if you don't remove those lines your uh, project will not be able to publish so uh, this is just as a first tip if you um, if you move your code from from the April update to the June update um, having said that um, I uh, wanted to uh, to focus on, um, uh, on, on web services and for that, um, or before we jump into code, I want to uh, show you that Microsoft already published a REST API, which means that now in AL code we have um, built-in support for calling REST web services um, by using HTTP client, HTTP content, etc. Now, uh, for those who uh, have followed my blog about web services or maybe seen a presentation about that, they will probably know that um, I was also using HTTP client in, uh, in my example. So, um, well, this is from me kind of feeling at home. Um, HTTP client is a, is a lightweight um, .NET uh, class that can be used to, well, to easily uh, call .NET web services um, and, and it does a lot of the, of, of the plumbing for, of, of setting up uh, headers and, and stuff like that is, is, is done automatically. Um, but you still have control over, um, over headers, you can do authentication, etc. Um, and, and, and that REST API is, is not only uh, about HTTP, but also about dealing with JSON, uh, just in AL code, which is, of course, totally new. Um, we have in AL code um, the possibility to work with uh, JSON objects, JSON tokens, uh, etc. So I have prepared uh, examples to, to show you a uh, or effects, uh, to, to show you two uh, examples how to use that. Um, so let's let's jump to the code. Um, I have an example here that is um, creating an, an extension to read all the uh, issues from GitHub all the issues that are um, uh, sitting in the, uh, uh, in the GitHub repo of, um, uh, of the AL extension, AL language. And um, for that I have created uh, a new table. Um, by the way, my, co my, my code is now sitting here. I, I got a, um, a message that uh, the key, the primary key, does not need to have an identifier anymore. So in the April update you had to do something like this. And now you see here the use of a unique ID has been deep shaded and the ID can be removed. So this is also a change in the June update. So I have created a new uh, table uh, over here uh, which contains uh, the ID, and the number, the title, uh, uh, the date, time, uh, the user state, and the URL of the uh, AL issues. Uh, and a page that um, contains uh, those. Um, those fields, so that well, that's it's just not uh, not that much different from from previous versions. And um, I do have an, um, an an action on this page that um, calls into a code unit, 
and this code unit is um, calling into uh, GitHub. Well, I, I've not done a lot in structuring this code. I uh, decided to, to just keep it simple and straightforward, so you see all the code just uh, uh, in, in, in the flow. Um, what you see here is uh, that we have an HTTP client uh, variable. Um, you can name that anything. I just um, uh, decided to call that one uh, HTTP client. The, what you see here, by the way, is that the coloring uh, on HTTP client is recognized as a, a keyword, and for that reason, he uh, thinks that he needs to color uh, that. That's probably not totally true. Uh, but anyway, uh, it is fine to, to call your variable exactly the, the, the same as, uh, as the type. So I have an HTTP client variable, and uh, on this HTTP client variable, I, I don't have to, to create it as a, a .NET uh, type. I don't have to call the constructor that is handled for me by the uh, AL code. Um, I need to, to set a request header. That's just a, a GitHub thing. Uh, if I don't uh, set a, a request header, if type user agent, then the call will fail. Uh, it's just cost me uh, about an hour to find out why uh, other tools uh, like Postman was, was doing well, but, but this one uh, did not work. But anyway, um, uh, you can see here that I can call into the HTTP client default request headers and uh, default request headers then is returning me uh, type HTTP headers and on that one I can call add so as you can see here I can now also do um, uh, multiple uh, dots here and and uh, to show you that that is really working I can just type this it was not possible with .NET before uh, if, if you had a, a, a nested a call, um, IntelliSense would only work on the, on the first level. So actually here it is working uh, in, in nested calls. So I do an add and, and, and specify that I want to add in, um, uh, another request header with the text uh, user agent and just anything. I, I, didn't know, I do not know why it comes with Dynamics 365 or whatever. Um, the next thing is um, I just can call a get, um, which is the um, uh, uh, providing the, uh, the URL of, of the web service, and um, it returns a response message. Now this response message is defined uh, over here, line seven, and is of type HTTP response message. So um, basically a call to a web service is nothing more than uh, calling HTTP client.get. Now there are more uh, possibilities here. We also have HTTP client dot, um, dot, dot post and dot put and dot send, etc. So these are all HTTP um, um, uh, commands or, or verbs that are uh, used to, to send uh, messages to, to web services. The most simple is of course get where um, we only say we want to uh, to get something from from a web service. Well, um, then if there is no error message and if we want to test on error messages, that is possible. Then we should do something like this, and we say if um, get. Just zoom out a little bit, and then we say then uh, begin and uh, end, and then we uh, do not get an error message, but we get uh, here into this code where we can say uh, what was exactly uh, the problem. We can um, uh, oh, should go to the response message. I should here uh, be able to find out what is the HTTP status code. That should be 200. If it's not 200, it was not okay. Um, I can test that with the is success status code. And uh, most important, the reason phrase. So if there is not, uh, if it is not successful, the reason phrase will give me uh, more uh, information about what was uh, going wrong. So basically, I could say uh, if there is not success status code, then uh, message reason phrase or something like that. So uh, let me remove this code again here. Um, let's assume everything. Uh, uh, goes okay, and um, my response message is now containing 
the uh, list of, of issues. Now this is um, this response message uh, contains a JSON text. And um, in the response message, I do have a couple of um, uh, uh, members, and one of them is the content um, uh, member, and the content is then containing the real um, uh, the real content that is returned by the web service, and that can be um, read uh, into um, uh, a variable, and actually it can be read into a stream, into an in stream or we can read it as a text. And as you can see here, uh, let me do it under here on this line, response message the content dot read as. As you can see here, we have an in-stream possibility and we uh, for read as. And uh, what I'm using here is a JSON text, meaning that this is a different thing that is a variable of type text. So read as is, um, uh, accepting both an, an, a text and an in-stream. So this is uh, .NET overloading uh, in, uh, in AL code, uh, in fact. So um, I do read as text, so I get my JSON into, uh, into text, and then I have to, um, to read that, that JSON. Um, and then there's something you need to know about JSON. JSON uh, in fact, JSON, um, uh, Microsoft is, is uh, uh, supporting you with four types, here JSON array, object, token, and value. Well, JSON token is, um, uh, you could say, the the, um, uh, the most important thing. The, everything is a, to uh, is a token in JSON. An array or an object or a value is, uh, is a JSON token. So a, a JSON token is kind of a generic uh, JSON thing. So uh, what I first do is um, I read uh, uh, from JSON text into a JSON token, and then um, I uh, put my um, uh, JSON token as an array uh, into a JSON array. Uh, why is that? That's just because um, this uh, here uh, returns me a JSON array. So uh, I, I have read that, I have interpreted the, the outcome of that, and I saw hey, uh, it re returns me a JSON array. Well, um, then I have JSON array, and then um, uh, every object in the array is 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 an is an uh, issue, and I can do a fork uh, to count, and um, and then I again on my JSON arrow, uh, array uh, do a get on on the current index for the JSON token. So I again get a JSON token. And that JSON token is then passed as an object into uh, an uh, JSON AL issue, which is also a JSON object. Um, so, and then I start with uh, initializing my table. Um, and the first thing that I want to do is um, to to get the the real property of the first uh, issue. So, let me quickly uh, show you the uh, the contents of uh, of this JSON. So you have an idea how that looks like. Uh, oops, he was not going to allow me to download that. Okay, so I cannot show it here. Anyway. Um, he shows me an, an issue with a lot of, of, of properties, and one of the properties is ID. Now, the property needs to be read into an adjacent value. Now, the first thing that I need to do here is to, to get from my object that ID into, again, a JSON token. And then, um, before the June update, uh, I needed to, to pass that uh, token as a value into a JSON value. So uh, I hope you see the, uh, the pattern here. We have an as value, an as object, an as array. So um, this is all uh, the JSON token. And then I can, into my records, pass my JSON value as an integral. Now if you look at that, that JSON value, uh, very quick look here, uh, the JSON value uh, can be uh, read uh, as Boolean, as byte, as car, uh, etc. cetera. So, um, that is, uh, it, of course, you need to know what it is. Uh, is it an integer? Is it a JSON value? Uh, is it an, an, a string or whatever? And that is, of course, uh, the, the JSON itself. You investigate what it uh, really contains. So in, in the June update, it is possible to do uh, a nested uh, thing like a JSON token.as value.as integer. 
this was a bug in, um, in the April uh, update and they have uh, promised to solve it and well they uh, delivered. Well, uh, the rest is just uh, uh, exactly the same kind of code. Um, let me quickly demonstrate that this is really working. Um, so, I publish this one. Uh, I have a uh, empty list here. I click on the refresh issues, and here I get a complete list of uh, issues on uh, on GitHub for uh, for AL. So basically, uh, straightforward um, uh, embedded uh, support of JSON and uh, and REST uh, REST web services. Um, I have another example that I also prepared, which is um, about the verify email address. The stupid thing here is that I cannot get this one published. It published on, on the April update, but it is not on the um, on the June update. So I need to figure out what is going on here. Uh, it, it, the package is, is created, but it's not being published. So there must be something in, in a table that I've created because it's complaining about SQL. Um, but basically, this is um, uh, the same uh, uh, basic structure. The only thing is I have now created a, um, a REST web service code that is more generic, and I can do anything with um, uh, accepts, parameters, uh, HTTP address authorization, base64 conversion. Um, I've been told that that will be available in the June update. I haven't tested it yet. Uh, I only have created my own base64 conversion uh, method. So um, I will definitely publish this uh, on my blog uh, very soon. Um, one simple thing that I came across when I tried to publish this on the June update, um, I do have a table over here, and um, in this table I have an option, and this is a new property, option members, that used to be option string, but now in the June update, option string has been replaced by option members. So just a uh, thing and then to, to notice. Well, that's it uh, for me for now for um, the um, REST support. I think time is up, so I need to stop. I can talk for half an hour, but uh, I think I need to stop here. Yep. Uh, thank you, Arjun. Um, I f yeah, it's, it's uh, three minutes past the time that we have allotted to it. I want to respect people's time uh, if you have other things to do. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending this webinar. Uh, it's been very informative. Uh, I felt a bit improvised because uh, of the June update. Uh, we had lots of interesting questions. Um, so uh, look for the recording. I'm sure that Mark will publish it on the um, uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and I think that's it, guys. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.